Okay, so we are live now. And hello, viewers, once again, we are back on Stay Can. We are Stay Can, standing together against child abuse and neglect. This is the Stay Can show. And we've got our wonderful panelists um, on here right now. Um, we will start with an introduction. So um, is it okay, William, to introduce yourself, please? All right, yes, my name is William Van der Poy. I'm an early years teacher, and I'm also an autistic advocate. I have a diagnosis of um, autism, and um, I have a master's degree in early childhood studies. I work across, um, I've worked across different settings in the UK, and apart from that, I'm also one of the directors mm -hmm. of an organization called AIM, Autistic Inclusive Meets. And we um, support individuals on the autistic spectrum and their families. We organize activities, um, social um, activities. We also do lots of campaign work, especially campaign against the mistreatment of autistic um, people um, and fake cures. Yeah, wow, wow. <laughs> if you say, William, if you say fake cure, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> lots of um, people out there view that autism can be cured. Okay. And that's what we are against. It's a very dangerous um, stand because autism is a um, neurotype. Hmm. That's the way our brains are wired. It's not a disease. We cannot be with autism and without autism. That's why I don't like to use the word person with autism, but I like you mm -hmm. see the word autistic, because we cannot separate autistic from who I am. That's who I am. Yeah. It's almost like we can't separate you from um, your Ghanaian-ness or your blackness. Sure. Sure. Part of sure. you, yes. So we see it as our identity. So we call it the identity first um, speech, um, as against the person first speech. So I am autistic. And um, People believe that autism can be cured, and they use lots of things to um, try to cure the individual from autism. And this can be quite dangerous, even sometimes fatal. Recently, um, there was this organization that had been trying to sell bleach as a cure for autism. And wow. uh, yes, and it's quite dangerous. The outcome is um, bowel lining coming out of. Um, mm. it's, it's really um, wow, 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 wow. Thank you. Yeah. So many places, even in Ghana, it's gotten there. And that thing is called Miracle uh, Mineral Solution. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've tried to campaign up against it. And it's now a criminal offense to be selling and administrating that drug. Administering that drug. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, William. Um, mm -hmm. Can we go to Auntie Sewa, please, Madam Sewa? Hi everyone, my name is Sewa Kwenoa. Most people call me Auntie Sewa. And um, I'm a parent and an autistic advocate. My son is 38 years old and um, I've been living in Ghana for the past 20, well, I moved to Ghana 22 years ago. But in the meantime, I was in the United States for many years when my son was diagnosed at the age of two. So it's been a very long journey and basically, that's me. I've been to many conferences and run um, many trainings and whatnot in Ghana. And I've also done some training. I, that's why I met Remy. Mm, we yes. <laughs> and doing some autism, uh, autism training. And um, yes. that's basically, over the years, I've volunteered in my son's school when nobody really knew much about autism. And uh, we were refer referred to as the cold mother syndrome. You, you know about that. And so it's been a very challenging journey. But I'm here trying to help other children in Ghana and across Africa and also the diaspora. So wow. Wow. We can see, you know, you are doing such an amazing, um, you know, work in Ghana. And it's just, it's just, you know, the, the selflessness, the zeal, you know, the desire to, you know, impact life is just amazing, yeah. Um, so can we come to Juliet, please? Yes, my name is Juliet Lardy. Um, I am, oh, I reside in the state of Texas um, in the United States. I am a general ed teacher. I've been teaching for about 10 years. I've taught um, 
pre-K through 12th grade and also adults, but my main focus is in elementary. Um, as a general ed teacher, I teach students generally, so all subjects. And then I have students that may have, uh, that have autism that are um, into my classroom. So we do like an occlusion type based thing. So I am their, their main teacher. And then I have a resource teacher that goes into support. Okay. Why? Okay. So we will move on to uh, Dr. Remy, please. Yes, my name is um, Remy Odunsi, and I live in UK. Um, I too am a mother of a child with autism, although she's twenty-two now. Um, she has mild autism, I will say, because. She went to mainstream school throughout her education and she's working now. Um, that's what brought in my interest into autism. And when I've seen what can be done for girls or for children with moderate autism in the UK, I tried to um, do my research in Nigeria to see what is going on in Africa. So I have a, a master's degree in autism and a PhD in education wow. of children with autism. Wow. Um, wow. I have worked with charities in Nigeria, in the UK. Anybody that needs me, I'm always there. Wow. <laughs> wow, that is so exciting, you know. Wow, this is an eye-opener. We've got such, you know, you know, experts over here with the experience, with the skills, with the knowledge, you know, this is what we need and we are, it's, it's a privilege really to have um, you all here. So we will just zoom right in and, you know, we, 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 we began this topic last week, um, you know, um, supporting um, children with um, special needs, you know, understanding uh, what special needs is all about and how best, you know, to, to, to uh, meet the overall care needs of uh, children. So, I mean, William, is it okay to start off with um, just a recap of what we, we did last week, please? Yes, we will start with a brief recap. So last week, we looked at what comes under special needs, and we saw that there were different types of needs. We've got emotional needs, we've got educational needs, we've got physical needs, and also we looked at what autism was. Um, it's been referred to as um, ASD, Autism Spe um, Spectrum Disorder, or ASC, Autism Spectrum um, Conditions. We've got different types, and uh, we've got um, what we used to term in the past as Canis Autism or Classic Autism. We've got um, what was also referred to as Asperger's Autism, which was believed to be at the higher end, but these days it's not called that anymore. We just refer to it as um, autism. We looked at the prevalence of autism, um, we saw that one out of four boys, no, um, no, one out of, ooh, I can't remember what we said. I think, yeah, one out of four boys had um, autism and one out of 16 girls had um, were autistic. Um, we also looked at um, the fact that autism was not caused by um, vaccines, um, not caused by refrigerator mothers or cold mothers, but it's um, a condition that, is um, associated with low birth rates, even though the link hasn't been really established, but there's a prevalence between um, prematurity and autism. We also saw that, that um, autism could be genetic as well. If there is, um, if a child is autistic, it's very likely that one of the parents has um, is autistic as well, and also. Um, there's an 18% chance, according to an article I read in the BBC, there's an 18% chance that one of the siblings will be autistic as well. Um, we looked wow. at the signs to look for, look out for, like walking on their toes, um, steaming, that's um, moving um, in such a way as to stimulate themselves. Um, and we briefly spoke about our real life experiences with um, autism. That's where we ended yesterday, um, last week. Wow, that's great. I mean, um, Madam Sawa, okay, now we've got Juliet uh, back on. Juliet, is there anything you want to add to what William has said? 
Nope. I think we basically recapped mm -hmm. a lot of what we discussed last week, and we mm -hmm. um, especially especially focusing in on the um, the correlation between mm -hmm. what causes it and the premature birth. I mm -hmm. think that's something that we mm -hmm. really went in depth with last week, just because mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact comment, but um, they mm -hmm. were asking us about. Um, the mother and the things that the mother did and, you know, things of that nature, but it was mm -hmm. more you know, correlated, even though they mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. recovery mm -hmm. there, more correlated with the low birth weight, not anything necessarily that has to do with the mother and what she does and doesn't do. Okay. Thank you so much. So I want us to move straight um, right in, you know, and last time, you know, some viewers came back to me and wanted to know more about the characteristics or you know, the signs that somebody, you know, has got or, or, or is uh, likely to, you know, be on the autistic uh, spectrum. So we would go into it a again, just for the benefits of our viewers. Um, and then again, I want us to also look at, you know, the impairments, you know, or, or you know, we know that the condition or, I mean, the condition of, you know, uh, uh, autism uh, spectrum disorder. It, I mean, it presents a number of difficulties for the child. I want us to, you know, talk about that a bit more. And I think that that will link also in well with the, you know, the science or the characteristics to look out for. So what are some of the difficulties, you know, everyday difficulties that a child with, you know, autism or a young person who is diagnosed with autism would have? What are some of the, you know, everyday difficulties? William, is it okay to start with you? And I would come to Dr. Remy, please. Okay. Um, I think I've got a little document I would like to um, share on my screen. Is it okay? Okay. If I share yeah, my let's screen, see. Um, I'll see if I can do it by here. Oh, do you want us to move on to? Uh, no, I've done it. Okay. Done it. Can you see my screen? No, we can't see anything. Oh, okay. No worries. Um, I'll just talk you through. So um, I'll use what we call the triad of impairments to okay. um, explain this. So the triad of impairment are the three main characteristics or criteria upon which a diagnosis is based. So the first um, impairment would be social interaction. An autistic child struggles with social interaction. Mm. And examples of this would be um, they might appear not to pay attention to others. They might appear aloof or distant or uninterested, being alone and withdrawn. And um, they might lack the social skills, inappropriate social behavior. Um, they might lack understanding about friendships or strangers, difficulties in making and sustaining friendships, and also difficulty in maintaining two-way conversation. Or sometimes they might even interrupt you when you are speaking. Mm. Um, next one is social communication. With social communication, they might not fully understand the meaning of common gestures and facial expressions or tone of voice. For example, if you are upset, they will not know that you are upset by your facial expression or by the tone of your voice. Um, they might have unusual patterns of verbal communication and unusual prosody, um, like a drone-like sound without no um, ups and downs in um, surprise. For example, I, for example, um, I work in the nursery and if um, a child comes to me with a drawing, Someone will say, oh, that's beautiful. I'll be like, oh, that's beautiful. I'll forget to put in that act. Because mm. that's some natural <laughs> yeah. Another one is echolalia. They might repeat what a person has said. Uh, for okay. example, say, hello, how are you? They also say, hello, how are you? There are two types of echolalia. The first one, they will just repeat it and leave it there. Others will, will say what you've said and answer the question. And um, that is more closely related to scripted speech. Now, um, okay. autistic people might use um, movies that they've listened to or books that they've read or quotations from other things to compensate for their lack of um, social or conversation um, impromptu skills. Um, you might find them reciting large passages of um, a script from a movie or something um, in response to something that you say. So as far as they're concerned, they're making conversation with you, even though you might find it strange. So they're making up. And also, um, autistic people have got the gift of making up words. Okay. <laughs> this language doesn't have, or whatever language we speak, doesn't have enough vocabulary to express what we really feel. One person coined up a word. He said, confuzzled. A mixture of confused and puzzled. Confused. Okay, wow. 
Twitter, what they want to say. Some of them might have difficulties with the word I or you. Instead of saying, I'm going to bed, they'll say, you are going to bed, because that's the way you talk to him. So, so they're also repeating it back to you. Um, there might be a lack of facial expressions and lack of gestures as well, an unusual eye contact. So that falls on the social communication. Then we've got um, the third one, that's social imagination or repetitive and obsessive interests. With that, under that, we've got difficulty in understanding how others think or react. And to illustrate that, I could use something called the Sally and Anne test. So I've got some tools okay. to help me to um, act this out. So this is Sally. Okay. <laughs> this is Anne. Wow, yes. this is so nice. Yeah, so this is Sally. Ooh, it's, and this is Anne. So um, Sally has got a basket, a green basket. Okay. And yeah. Anne has got a box. Okay. Now Sally has a ball. Can you see the ball? Yes, yes. <laughs> she places the ball inside her basket and goes out for a walk. While she's outside, Anne takes the ball from the basket and puts it inside her box. Sally returns. Where is mm -hmm. Sally going to look for the ball? Now, most people understand that Sally does not have the information that we have and the information that Anne has, that the ball has traveled from the basket into the ball. So most people will say that she is going to look straight inside the basket where she last placed it, yeah? Mm -hmm. An autistic child is more likely to say that Sally would go straight into the box and pick her ball. Why? Because they know that it's in the box and they cannot differentiate between Sally's mind and their own mind. They believe that whatever they are thinking, everybody is thinking the same. So wow. this is called mind blindness, the inability to know that someone's thoughts are different from your thoughts. And wow, you thank you. Yeah, thank you, William, for the illustration. It's so good. It's so practical, you know. Thank you for that, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. It reminds me um, of when I was a little boy in France. We went to a pharmacy to purchase something, but the man didn't have change. The pharmacist didn't have change. So the, he asked us to go and come back with the change. So they gave us the item. When we got home, my mother gave me the change to come back to the pharmacy and um, give the money to the pharmacist. When I got there, I think about um, 20, 30 minutes later, I failed to understand that the pharmacist has seen so many people that <laughs> she had forgotten about me. So I just walked to the man and just dropped the coin in front of him. And for the next five minutes, we just stood looking at each other. I was expecting him to say, oh, thank you. And I'll say, you're welcome. The thank you never came. So I couldn't say that you're welcome. That was my script. So we looked at each other until he said, okay, so what's it? Are you going to speak? And I said, oh, yeah, um, we came to pay earlier on, but you don't have change. So I was... He said, oh, okay, you should have said it. So that's an example of not being able to um, imagine that someone doesn't have the information that I have. It's called wow. And that alone leads to something called problems with imagination. Difficulty in developing imaginative play. We can't really imagine scenarios, putting ourselves into someone else's shoes to act a, a, a play. Um, that's why you see many children playing inappropriately with toys, lining them up. For example, I've got a little pony over here. I'll line it up instead of playing with it like, oh, hello, how are you? I'm fine. I'm going to the market. That kind of thing. No, they'll line it up and have things like that because that's the way they interact with it. Another problem that an autistic person might have is having a literal understanding of language. Literal understanding okay. of language. By this, I mean having difficulties with expressions like it's raining cats and dogs or pull your sleeves up, because that's exactly what they're going to do. Last week, I gave an example of someone I told, uh, an autistic boy I told, hey, sometimes come and say hello to me. And every time he used to come in to my office and say hello to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she was um, once in the nursery, um, there was this child who was presenting um, um, traits of autism, but he wasn't diagnosed yet. And um, one of the practitioners said, go to the toilet and go and wash your hands. Everybody understands that because the 
sink what's in the toilet actually and everybody goes to wash their hands there the child went she actually went inside the toilet bowl and washes luckily another practitioner just walked in and saw him and pulled him off yeah because um people you know, like in the autistic spectrum are quite um literal and they are very trusting they trust in everything that you see at least most of them not all of them but most of them so it's um something you um that's worth thinking about when you are given instructions to an autistic person also problems with predicting events or actions when i'm reading a book for example i'm quite shocked at the outcome of people's um actions because i take people at face value it's hard for me to believe that someone would do this thing because i wouldn't do that the fact that I wouldn't do it means that you will also not do that. So it's uh, one of the things. It's quite crucial because um, as a vulnerable person, you might end up falling into the wrong hands mm -hmm. and trusting the wrong people. There's also apparent obsession with parts of objects. You see children who are obsessed with um, parts of hoovers or parts of washing machines mm -hmm. because um, many people on the autistic spectrum see not the big picture, but parts of it, and they mm -hmm. focus on it. They have narrow interests. They have set routines as well. Um, if the routine is broken, um, they might appear quite distressed. And finally, um, they might exhibit some vocal stimming. Stimming is when they um, do some actions to regulate themselves. We have um, vocal stimming. You might see them making some sounds here. They're making sounds with their mouths. Auditory stimming. I had to do something when I was a little boy. I'll just close and open my ears because the um, alternation between the noise and the, the silence calmed me down. Um, you might see people um, engaging in visual stimming, closing their eyes, opening them, or maybe closing them um, halfway because your eyelashes mix a pattern with the light. And sometimes you we stare at CDs, turning it around, looking at the spectrum of colors, it's really beautiful, calms us down. Um, all these are sensory needs. Whenever you see a child um, engaging in stimming, it's best not to stop them, especially if they are not in danger. If they are not endangering themselves or they're not endangering anyone, just let them do it. But the way of regulating themselves. So that um, is a summary of um, what the autistic people go through. Wow, that is so good, you know. Thank you so much. That is so detailed, really, really detailed. Before we come to Dr. Remy and then we, we go to Juliet and we come to uh, Madame um, Selwa, I want to read some of our comments over here. So we've got uh, Amma Brakote is a great education topic. Uh, we've got um, Inchiraba Mami is saying that, uh, Miss Ma Boatin is saying that, thanks, I am learning. Uh, We've got Kofi saying that excited about part two. Last discussion was really uh, was working. And we've got um, we've got a long one here by Pauline says I'm glad to be on with you all. My name is Pauline. Uh, I am a, a UK trained consultant and um, clinical psychologist in private practice. I'm specializing in neurodevelopmental disorders, including ASD. I am also a mother of five young people one of whom is 25 and has autism and ADHD. He is also an accountant. I work across the UK and internationally, including the Caribbean, Nigeria. And last year, I spoke at an autism conference in Ghana, organized by Hannah Otu. It is clear we have a lot of experience. Wow, thank you so much. That is, that is really good. Thank you so much, Pauline, for sharing with us. And thank you for supporting um, us. Yes, yeah, so um, we would move on to um, Dr. Um, Remy to just, you know, again, we are looking at um, the presenting challenges or, or the difficulties uh, experienced by um, children and young people who are diagnosed with um, um, autism um, uh, disorder, you know, the everyday challenges, yeah. Yes, I think um, William has actually, he's covered a lot he has really covered a lot of grounds. Well done. That's very good. Um, as I said at the beginning, <laughs> that um, my interest is uh, those children that are in the middle of the spectrum, the ones who, like I said, will probably start in mainstream school. And as mm. they grow older, as they go through the years, they may start exhibiting some behavior 
or from the way they interact with the other children. <laughs> the other children, I, I, I'm using my daughter as an example, will say, oh, you're weird, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> they don't understand what is wrong with them. The children don't understand what is wrong with them. So those are the ones I'm most interested in because I feel that they're the ones losing out. The ones mm. who have severe autism, yes, there's a lot of intervention going on. There's a lot. Once they're diagnosed, but the ones in the middle, especially in Africa, they ne most of them are not diagnosed and they struggle through life. Anyway, just to go back to what William was saying about sensory issues, again, there's, we say some can be hyposensitive and mm. some can be hypersensitive. Some can be very sensitive. For example, to touch. Some don't like touch. Meanwhile, some like to be hugged. Some have they're sensitive to pain and some are not. You find that some will have their bones broken and they will not even know that anything has happened to them. So then there's a sense of um, taste. Because of that, because of their sensitivity to taste, some will only eat one type of food because of the texture of the food. So these are sensory issues that are involved in autism. And in terms of um, hearing, I remember one of the children I used to teach his, uh, his um, sense of hearing was so high. He said when he, he, people are talking to him, it's like when a train is approaching and very close to you. Can you imagine how you will feel? And mm. that's how he can describe his sensitivity to any sound. So that's why, like William said, you see them with their hands or their fingers in their ears. It's just because of their sensitivity to sound. Um. The other thing that I, I try to look that uh, William has not mentioned again is the comorbid conditions. Okay. Um, the lady, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the clinical psychologist mentioned ADHD. These are yeah. one of the comorbid conditions of autism. Again, a child, yes, a child with autism is still a child. So you may mm -hmm. have a child with autism who is dyslexic. A child with autism who has problems with um, uh, with maths, what we call dyscalculia. So there are all these comorbid conditions. You know, then we know that a lot of children with autism also have um, epilepsy. Mm. That's another comorbid condition. So there are a lot of comorbid conditions with um, autism. So I think I'll stop here for now. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Remy. In terms of Juliet, in terms of, you know, your experiences, you know, um, the children you have come across, you know, what are some of the presenting challenges they experience? Um, I would agree with everything that's been stated. Um, I know the sensory issue is huge. Um, at my prior school, because I worked at, I worked in public education, so when we would have assemblies, we would um, give those students headphones to place over their ears, and then if it became too much, then they could exit out. Um, we also had a sensory room. So we would use a sensory room to take the students in there and kind of for them to kind of bring themselves down and regulate. So different things in the sensory room, like we had tiles and the tiles would have liquid in them that they could touch with their hands, play with their feet. We had trampolines in there. We had things on the walls that they could touch. And we also would have um, weighted blankets. We used weighted blankets sometimes and we even used like a suit. So with the suit, the child would put the suit on, it would make them feel touched or hugged or, you know, it would give them the sense of someone like arms around them. So for in our cases, a lot of our students that did have sensory issues, we would have a lot of things. Um, I had one that had sensory with mouth. And so he would keep something in his mouth and it had like a Lego on it and it mm -hmm. vibrated the whole day. So he would just chew on it. So that way that would help him regulate himself. Um, and he was also, again, like William said, they become obsessed with something. He was obsessed with trains. So everything always related back to trains and what trains could do and how trains moved, how trains were put together um, and things of that nature. So sensory is very, very huge as well, you know, for, uh, for, our, for our autistic students. Wow. Thank you, Juliet. And what comes to Madam Sewa in terms of your experiences, obviously you 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 already had a have a child, so you've got lots of experience, you know, real, real life experiences and all that. Could you please uh, just 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 highlight a few of the experiences? I mean, the challenges faced by children and young people who have been diagnosed with autism and spectrum disorder. 
Yeah, for my son, I would say William again has covered a lot of things. My son had the issues with the hearing, blocking his ears. We always went to check with him when I lived outside Ghana. But in Ghana, with the drums and everything, you know, there's so much noise in church that he's not doing church so well. And with other children, as we talked about the sensory issues, it's important that most people know that when the children they say, oh, this child is misbehaving, the child is not misbehaving per se. The child has sensory challenges. And if you cannot talk with the children who are nonverbal and they have the sensory difficulties, this is why they want you to know if you see a particular behavior, and this is what I see with the children, with the different behaviors, they are trying to tell you something. So we tell them that communication is the key. You have to try and get to the place where the child is. And even in the case in point, my son wanted um, plantain chips, which I have hidden from him because he likes the crunch, you know, and he likes the way it feels. And because I said, you cannot get plantain chips because you can write it. And you can also sound it out to me because he's able to say things, although he doesn't really talk. He knows to write plantain chips and he knows how to say plantain chips. So you have to, and Temple Grandin, who is a very huge advocate, she herself has autism. And she says her mother did not let her get away with anything. You have to, no matter what the issues are, be it sensory, be it social interaction, be it, you have to get the child to at least do it once it's not hurting them. Because if you say, oh, because he won't do it, you're going to do it for him. And this is what we do at the center. Any child who comes in there, you mentioned about somebody eating and so we have to train them. It takes, it takes long. That's, this is why we do a one-on-one one -on -one care. Because if it's very, very challenging, and there's so many different issues. Like last week I said, when you see one child with autism, you have seen that person with autism. Don't say, oh, William is the same as John or the other. They may have similar things in common, but when you really work with them, you can tell they're totally different. So you have to go and see how you can get into the place of this child. How does this child feel? How can you help them to overcome whatever challenges? And it's important that when they're stimming, you don't try to change them unless, and it's been mentioned, they're trying to hurt themselves. Because children, some of the children bang their heads. Mm -hmm. And you can't allow that to happen. That's also stimming. But parents, is very, very challenging. And William mentioned last week about tippy toes and stuff. But you have to see how you can get the child not to hurt themselves, but don't try to change them per se. Obviously, we don't allow them to bang their heads. That we don't allow because it's not, it's going to cause further brain damage because already there's something that has gone awry with the brain. So further brain damage. So we, we protect them. We have a sensory room where we have cushions and whatnot. And if you want to bang your head on the pillows, you know, we will stay with you until whatever and try to ascertain why you are doing this kind of behavior. Sometimes it could be too hot in the room and it's bothering the child. It could be too cold. As Remy has mentioned, hyper and hypo sensitivities. Those who are eating who will not chew. We've had a child who's come there and was drinking Aosa Koko. That is the only thing he would eat. He was six years old. He was so emaciated that we had to work with him. So how do we get and work with the parents to get this child to eat something else? And it's not by force. You have to go gradually and introduce them to different things. Yes, when you do, they will eventually get it. But don't expect that it's going to happen overnight. We had this child who was eventually, we got him to eat, um, what do you call it, ground soup and soft bangu, because he didn't want to chew. But as I speak now, that, that child has gone to mainstream, and he's even eating rice. So you can't give up and say, oh, the child won't do this. And we have to really do a lot of parent training 
to their parents to help them understand why all the different things are happening, especially with the sensory issues. Parents cannot stand it. They cannot stand the stimming. They could stop it. Oh, it's annoying you. Oh, too bad for you. He is feeling pretty good doing what he's doing, slapping the hands and doing it. It's, you know, but slowly they, with, when they have this test come, it's like, they think it's embarrassing. What's so embarrassing about that? And slowly you, and you, you try to tell a happy child like that, and we say, oh, when you see visitors, if as much as possible that you want to, or maybe you can think of a song that you're singing and also trying to fuck it, and get the child in, and try to see how you can get into the autistic person's condition, how to try and understand them, not as wanting to change them. William, am I right? We don't want to have to change them. We all want to understand them, but we want to also do what is socially. I don't, the autistic would beat me in this, but socially acceptable. And but slowly you get you get there. But if it's making my son, if my son is blocking his ears and there are visitors around, well, too bad for you, the visitor, because it's making him feel good. And but as a parent, you have to explain to your family visitors, friends, you have to teach people about autism. Because if they don't know, how will they accept that your child, well, they call him weird or whatever and all kinds of different names. It is up to us parents and the autistics who are high functioning, as William is doing today, to explain to people what is going on and what is it, it's making them feel. Because if we don't let people know that, oh, this is what is happening, we have a child at the center who oh, I bet can even hear the, the sound from the phone wire. Because we've watched them, whenever he goes near some of these wires and he just blocks his ears, and some of these earphones also don't really, he just takes it and throws it away. It's, it's, it's very challenging, as we have said, sensory issues are a key. So I believe that whenever we have training for any child that we're trying, we need all disciplines not just one particular discipline. So what I tell people, we have an eclectic type of program. When you come to the center, you have to be willing to work with us. Don't come and say, we have a lot of specialists who come to our, our center. Don't come with an attitude and tell me, oh, this is the only one that works and it is, it is uh, been proven and blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's been proven. To, that's the, what the statistics say. And what they're saying, but this particular child is not responding. So the practitioners have to see the child and really try to understand. And like I said, it's about communication. Mm. How are you communicating with this child? If the child cannot talk, are you using text? Are you using pictures, taking photographs from their home? Every child from their home should have pictures of their parents, pictures of their siblings, pictures of what they do at home, so you can work with them so they have a familiarization of what's going on. But sometimes if we just go to the text and just go to the state figures and whatnot, like it is, it is not the real thing for them. If you're talking to a child about their mom or their dad, have their picture. Don't have a, a text picture to show them. I personally believe anything that you can make look real, make it look real. I'm not a speech therapist. Mm. I'm not, I'm a mom. And I know what has worked with my son and what has worked with so many other children over the years. Yes, we use specs, we use ABA, we culturally approved, that would be ABA. We don't use the ABA that we're training children to be like, like a dog trainer, as, um, as um, William said last week. But ABA, for some children, it depends on how it is done, it, it works. Because when you have a child banging the head and banging the head, you need to get the child to stop. Because you cannot sit down and watch the child hurt themselves. But I would like to talk to William later about that, how you get the behaviors to, you know, that will hurt them. You need to get it to stop. So it's important that parents listening to me out there, in Africa, in the diaspora, Ghana, wherever, you need to go and get parent training. You need to be trained. You need to understand 
what is going on with your child and read and read and read as much as you can. Unfortunately for us in Ghana and across Africa, there are people who haven't gone to school and they cannot read. So we have to help them understand in the local languages and then have the pictures in local languages, which we are going to get to and let them know this is why we're doing this. During this COVID time, we have been visiting some homes. Uh, for those of you from, in, uh, from Ghana, um, like Nima, we have children in Nima, Mahubi, and these are really depressed areas. Mm. They're very challenging areas. We've been going to their homes, and if you can imagine if you are living in um, a compound house, and you can't get a child to even get a corner to you know work and do their work. So they leave the child in front of TV all day, or if they are lucky to have a phone, and they're constantly on the phone. So what we have been doing is visiting these parents and taking them some bubbles, taking them some sensory toys, taking them um, what they can use for speech. And we say, don't worry about speaking English. If you speak Awuza or Chi or whatever, we get some of our caregivers who speak these languages and we go with them to work with the parents and we try to go at least once a week to see how the children are doing. So it's very, very, very challenging, but we have to keep at it because we've already realized there are quite a few of them regressing, which is so heartbreaking for me because there are children who have been fully trained, who are going back on to wearing diapers. It just breaks my heart because mm -hmm. when they come to a center and they are in diapers, we take the diapers off. If we're going okay. to do train, there's no need for diapers. Diapers are expensive to begin with. So these are people, and usually the people who don't have money are doing wearing diapers. Where do you get money to afford diapers? So you come to school, you can come to school in a diaper so that you don't solve the whatever. But when you come to school, and then we teach you how to toilet train. This is why we don't call ourselves a school, because we do so many things. Teaching you how to brush your teeth, how to eat, how to bathe, how to do all these things. Every child at our center gets to learn how to brush their teeth. And I think uh, you can imagine with those of them who have issues and you have the bristles of the toothbrush, sometimes it feels like needles in their mouth and they're screaming and whatever when we first start. But we have to because otherwise, the research has found that there's so many children with autism who have bad dental, um, what is it? Why can't I think now? You know, they have cavities yeah. and they have difficult yeah. challenges dental with hygiene. dental hygiene. Yeah. yeah. So this is the thing we have to work with and every child has to brush your teeth. And you as a mother or father will also have to come in and learn how to do this. Because you can't just sit there and say, hey, coffee won't brush your teeth. You can't live without brushing your teeth. You have to learn and do this. And we've seen so many children, or you see a child of uh, maybe I'll say a teenager who cannot take a bath, a lease. What, what, what have you been doing? So we take time and we, if you, you are a man, the father, if there's a father in the house and it's a boy, you have to take a shower with your son and teach him how to bath. Because I um, mentioned Brandon again, her mother did a lot with her. And she did not take no for an answer. You go to do it this way and come on, lift your arm and then you'll be teaching them. This is your right arm. This is your arm. It said, using the science, you know, the body parts. And every moment is a teachable moment that you talk to these children. Don't say because oh, this child is non-verbal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't even talk to them. They mm -hmm. just talk to them about mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. and do this. So talk to them like you would talk to anybody else. And mm -hmm. you'll be amazed at the communication that will go on. And you can tell from their eyes and their happiness. And when I see a child that they like, they can do something, go, great job. And it's like we, we won the lottery. I feel like sometimes, you know, when somebody achieves something, I feel like I won a huge amount of money. Yes, I need that to finish our center. But this is the thing. You have to show the children that, oh, they have done some work, something, at least a crime. 
trying, anytime they try, it means they've done something. You need to reward them with a clap, mm. jump, and dance, or whatever. You just make them feel good. And yeah. don't just leave them in the corner because they know. They know when you love them and they know when you don't. Autism doesn't mean, it just means within self. That's all it is. It doesn't mean they can do. If you teach them, you know, those children on the lower end of the spectrum, it is very, because this is what I really see. I see children on the upper end, but we usually end up sending them to the schools to do inclusion. But it is very, very, very challenging. But I find some parents feel they can just bring the children and leave them, and we are supposed to manage them and find a cure and do whatever. And what I must say is also diet is so important over the years. We have realized that it is from what they eat. At the center, when you come, sugar is out. If you bring juice that has sugar in it, we will not give it to the child. You won't even see it again because if somebody wants to drink it, there's a, and I'll let you know, we're going to give it to the caregivers if they want it. But we will give the child the water because when God gave us this earth, he gave us water. We yeah. don't give it juice. And I think wow. I'll continue that so somebody else can <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Madam Sewa. That is a lot of information. You know, from if you are watching, Madam Sewa is in Ghana. She's got this wonderful foundation going on in Ghana. And you can see that's on the screen. If you want to, like, you know, call, contact them, the foundation to support in any way or, you know, to, to contribute, you know, I've got the numbers um, on the screen. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, like Madam Sewa said, you know, no no, no two people are the same and uh, you can't therefore say that, you know, this child has got ASD and that child has got ASD and therefore, you know, in terms of your approach, you're going to use the approach, a similar approach or the same approach for them because each child is unique, each child is different. And, um, and then again, talking about, um, you know, last time we, last time we, we did um, mention about some, that, you know, the challenging behaviors displayed by, you know, children with, um, some children with ASD, you know, William, 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 William did say that sometimes it's because they are trying to communicate something. And then Madam Sewa is also saying that, you know, you know, a child may be feeling too hot in a particular room and a child may be, you know, and obviously the child is feeling too hot. The child who is nonverbal, you know, would display certain behaviors to communicate to you that, you know, this room is so hot or, or I am tired or I want to do A, B and C. In terms of communication, you know, what are some of the tools or how best can we communicate with children who are, you know, autistic and who are not nonverbal? What are some of the best ways, um, you know, to communicate? Uh, William, are we able to start with you? Yes, before I start, I would like to um, make a note or a disclaimer that the fact okay. that the child is nonverbal mm -hmm. does not mean that the child is unintelligent. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's very easy for us to just say whatever we like in front of a child who is nonverbal and appears to be in their own world not knowing that they understand every single thing that the child says. I know someone who is nonverbal. Um, she's a friend of mine, nonverbal, and she's got so much bitterness against um, the parents because of all the things they've said against her while she was growing up. And she remembers every single thing. And now yeah. she's nonverbal, she doesn't speak, but you know what? Um, she finds it hard even to hold down a job. She has challenging behavior. She's been sectioned many times. She's always been arrested by the police to take to the mental hospital, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? She's also got um, a degree in um, pharmacology. So that proves that wow. verbal wow. communication is not a definite um, thing. It's not something to judge a child on. It's just one of the means of communication. We've got other means of communication. We've got sign language, we've got pegs, we've got makaton, so many different um, kinds of um, communication. Wow, wow, thank you so much. Um, in terms of communication and your experience, Juliet, is it okay? Okay, Madam, someone wants to say something and I would come to Juliet, yeah. Uh, with the communication, what you said, you know, like the sign language, the text, the, um, and I said about taking photos. And use communication as a tool to, when you're in the, like you go outside with a child, 
I don't really personally like just to have a book that you communicate with. Like use the leaves to teach a color green. Look at the sky and you teach things around you, things within your environment. It's very, very, very important. Because if they're just using different, like, oh, using a Legos and blah, 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 no, with autistic children. This is when you ask him what is green, he's going to look for a Lego, a green Lego, and, and tell you this is green. But you, when you're working with leaves, we get dried leaves, and we get fresh leaves, and dried leaves are brown. And even we have what we call the flamboyant uh, tree in Ghana, he has these beautiful flowers. But it has these seeds. The seeds are, it's like a pot. And then we use the seeds and the soak is brown. So we use the seeds also, the, the, the whole pot, for music therapy. Because and, uh, I see, a, you know, and it's, it's amazing. And then we take the seeds out that and use them for counting. Use things in, in the environment so that the children will also see this. Don't just keep them boxed up, you know, for communication. Use things within your environment. And when you're at home with them, also talk to them. Like they're very intelligent. Let them know what's going on. I posted, uh, my son was busy doing gardening just last week. I think some of you may have seen it. And he's planting some okra, and he keeps saying green okra, green okra. And I'm like, enough, okay, I know it's green. Okay, but he's in the garden because he loves okra stew. And uh, you have to, anything in your environment, the tomato before it becomes red has to be planted. So you explain all these things. So like gardening, you use it for communication. Communication doesn't necessarily have to be like you've been taught that the tools for communication. But as our children grow, they learn because they happen to be able to speak. And, but with these children, we have to make an effort to teach them everything. Thing. Everything has to be taught. And if you're going, oh, the car, you're going around, maybe going for a walk, you use the opportunity to, okay, let's see who finds the red car first. And then you're, you're doing color red a week. So don't show me any other car. I say, show me a red car. You know, that kind of thing. We have to communicate with them. Be talking to them as much as they're not talking back to us. We just talk to them as if we look at them. But sometimes you have to be very animated. We are doing things with these kids. And you know, and some of the people look at me as like my age and I'm, this is when I'm reading to them. It has to be animated. You can't sit. Because what kind of communication are you teaching them? If you're just doing sitting there, blah, 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 doing that, you no, know, there's nothing really going on. But they look at you. And you, you can tell. And we do reading to them and they look at you. Oh. And then you're pointing to the pictures in the page. This is all communication. This is all communication. And then we, then we do what the speech therapists teach us to help them communicate even better. So that's a lot. That we should just let them be like mm. us and us mm. all get into their world. Mm. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Madam Sewa. Thank you for the point, for the contribution. Um, yes, we should just let them do what they need to do and then put in a lot of effort. Um, in terms of um, Juliet, what is your experience, you know, in terms of communication? What approaches or what, what tools have you used? Um, I would agree. We do do sign language here. Um, uh, the speech therapists, you know, they mainly work with our students that are nonverbal. So they're not in a gen ed setting. They're in a different type of setting. But um uh, sign language. And then, um, as Madam Soa said, a big one is um, what we call here called visual schedules. So the visual schedule would be a schedule of that student's day and it's in a folder and they kind of carry it around with them or with their desk or it's at their desk. And they'll give them like when they get to school, they'll move from like they're now not at home anymore. They're now at school. So they'll move their picture. It'll be a picture of the student. And I'll maybe the top uh, left, it says home. And on the top right, it'll say school. So they'll move themselves to school so that they understand that they're now at school. So just basically reinforcing with pictures. And we do use realistic pictures. If they have to go to the resource teacher, it's a picture of the resource teacher's face and they move it there. And then at the end of the school day, they've gone through all their different um, tasks and then they'll move them back so that the next day that they start over. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of a reinforcement, mm -hmm. even though they're not technically able 
to speak. And that's what we have to get to is just because they don't speak does not mean that they don't understand. That is a very strong disconnect there that I think a lot of people think when it comes to nonverbal students, that because they don't respond back, it means that they're not understanding and that's not the case. So this basically reinforcing what we're saying and also being very mindful of what we're saying when we're speaking um, to students. Because again, even though they cannot respond back to us verbally, it does not mean that they have not processed what we have said verbally. So being very just conscientious of what we're saying and what we're putting in those students' um, minds and, and you know making sure that we're building them up and building their self-esteem and realizing, yeah, I, I'm just like, even though I have, you know, I'm a student, you know, that has autism. I'm not different than my classmates in that sense. Making sure that we're building up because I'm as we're going through this, I was looking at this kind of off real quick. I know you're going to get here, but it was a um, a comment from Paul asking should an autistic child be treated differently. And I read that and I was like, oh, no, we treat all, I treat all students the same because it's about the person. We're teaching them how to be people in a realistic society. No, we don't treat them the same. Everybody gets the same treatment, but some of us just may need a little extra help. So that's how I look at it. Yeah, thank you. And um, Dr. Remy, do you want to add anything to the discussion in terms of um, you know, how to communicate with uh, nonverbal ch uh, children with ASD? Um, I don't really have anything. I think everything has been covered, really. But the only thing is, um, I'm a math teacher. I'm a trained math teacher. And I've always said math is very abstract. So, mm. so all the things that I use to teach my students who have special needs, they're the things that you use for children with autism. They're visual learners. And so when you make things visual, concrete, they learn. So I, I agree with everything that has been said. The only thing I need to add, which is not about how the, about this to so the characteristic is from my own daughter, anxiety is something we, 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 we left out. Children with autism, especially the ones that are still in the middle, they're always very anxious because they don't like change. And so when it comes to change, they're very, very anxious. I mean, for my daughter, if you're going to a new place that she has never been before, you can see that the anxiety will be so much that she can become sick. So uh, when people say, oh, that child is stubborn, and I say, no, no, that child is not stubborn, that's autism. They don't like change. So can I just stop there? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow, that is such an interesting discussion. Now, let us just look at some of the comments over here. Um, yeah, so Ken, um, Ken is saying that the autistic child should eat with siblings and the rest of the family at, um, at the table. And, and then we've also got uh, Pauline's comment is um, quite a big one, which is covering the whole screen. So I'll just read it. It says that, unfortunately, a lot of what I call lazy assessments are carried out once a diagnosis of ASD has been reached, the assessment for many ends. This practice can be extremely damaging for um, someone who may have a number of, you know, um, um, a number of conditions, like including um, ADHD, depression, OCD, and learning difficulty, and, you know, among others. So, I mean, without a proper assessment and diagnosis, it is going to be harder for the child uh, to, let me just see if I can, uh, yeah, to make, um, well, so basically, I mean, Pauline is just saying that, you know, sometimes, you know, we have situations whereby children have been diagnosed and I have come across a few of them in my practice. So we, we've got them diagnosed, we've got them, you know, they've gone through the assessments and then they've got a diagnosis. However, you know, it ends there, the support is not there. Then, I mean, somebody would ask that, what is the point then if, you know, um, you know, the child is not going to be, you know, well supported, then what, what is the essence, I mean, of, of that? William, have you come across anything like that? I mean, situations whereby people have been diagnosed with ASD and then it ends there. There's no other support for the child, for the young person or the child. Um, only in the UK, what I know is that once you've got the diagnosis, mm -hmm. it opens the way for you to get um, adequate mm -hmm. support from support, okay. all sorts of different channels, from the educational sector, from the social sector, from the health sector. It's, um, you have adequate support. Um, mm -hmm. 
it all depends on the local authority where you find yourself mm -hmm. in, where you have enough you know, um, sign mm -hmm. it's, it's possible that one can fall out mm -hmm. uh, from the radar once they get their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. In such yeah, case, I mm -hmm. the individual to keep pursuing, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. let others know about their needs. Keep pushing. Yeah, keep yeah. pushing. Keep pushing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Remy, can we come to you? Have you had any experiences, you know, situations whereby we've got um, children diagnosed of ASD, but then it, I mean, it ends up ending there, kind of. There's no other support. Yes, that, I, mean, I mean, it depends on where you live. In, in the UK, I would say that, yes, there is support, but again, it depends on the school, the parents, the parents have to push. They mm. have to push. I mean, at my church, I've spoken to a lot of parents when they say, oh, but the child's been diagnosed, they're not doing anything. I said no, or you have to push. You ask, mm. you have to ask for this, you have to ask for that. And I've actually had to attend meetings with parents at school to challenge mm. what is being done at school, despite the fact that they have a legal document that states clearly what the provisions should be. They still have to fight for it. Because really, the uh, in, in the UK, most of the interventions for children with autism, it's tied to NHS, and we all know that NHS is spread very thinly. So what I tend to do is to um, advise the parents that, look, you're being given money, you're being given a disability living allowance. Use that for private speech therapy, for whatever, rather than holding on to the money. That's what the government is giving you the money for. So parents have to push, as well as spend the money they're given on the child. In Africa, I mean, from my own experience in Nigeria, like I said, my research, both for my master's degree and my PhD was in Nigeria, looking at the provision for children with special needs, especially autism. There's practically nothing. Only the rich people can afford it. Very, very few. I mean, I've only met two speech therapists in Lagos. Wow. So, I'm not saying they're not there, <laughs> but they're for the very rich, the very rich mm -hmm. at the top. Mm -hmm. So even the middle class, they'll have to struggle for it. So even if the child is diagnosed, which in Nigeria, they're very few, then the parents still have wow. to struggle. Wow. So, wow. That is that is really disheartening, you know. It's really heartbreaking. You it know? is very I mean, and, and and I mean it just it just it just demonstrates that in, you know in, in 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 like you know in other countries you know you know the, the awareness is not there and therefore you know the support is also uh, limited. I mean, Madam Sewa, do you have anything to add to this discussion in terms of you know what uh, Dr. Ruby is just saying about you know Nigeria? What what's the situation in Ghana like? Well, the situation in Ghana. And I'll say across Africa, it's rather dire. Mm. In Ghana, thankfully, we've been on ground here for about 22 years, trying to raise awareness to lead to acceptance. Thankfully, I mentioned last time that few schools that are now coming in being set up. But the thing is, people get a diagnosis of autism. We have about five, I think, five neuropediatricians. Neuropedi now in Ghana. When I first came, it was there was none, and then there was Dr. Baby, then there was another one. Thankfully, we have about five, which is still not enough. But people get a diagnosis, then sometimes they tell them, oh, it's autism on the level one, level two, level three, or whatever. It doesn't mean sport to me, because autism is autism. The person needs an intervention from day one. So some people are given the false sense of security, I will say, that, oh, your child is not so bad. But what is really bad about autism? So they are told that, oh, go to regular school without any support. There's no support teacher. And you put the child in a classroom of about maybe 20 kids. So therefore, this child is left to be roaming or doing whatever, they can't handle the child. Because maybe the child has difficulty sitting down, maybe attending, or different things. So it's important that the, the child who 
equals to regular school to for inclusive an inclusive setting. It has a, a facilitator who has been trained to work with this child with autism or other special needs. Because if you expect a teacher like Juliet to be working with uh, your child and giving the attention and teaching them the way we can sit down and you know, really take time with the child. Let's say the child cannot eat. And who should be doing feeding the child or seeing to these needs? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Ghana, it's very difficult. Most people, they don't want, I call it the A word, you see. They think it's such a bad word. So they prefer to go to regular school because if they come to a center like ours or other places, or oh, you're mixing with those children, as they say. What do you mean those children? Your child also has autism or Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or other developmental disability. It's important that parents get trained. When they, anyone who's hearing this, when you get a diagnosis in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, wherever, please see how because as far as I know, there are people within the cities who have started schools and support services so that you can find some help. If somebody can help you train a facilitator to go to the learning support program, to go to the regular school with, with the child. Because I believe that the child who is in the middle or higher functioning really belongs in regular school. Even the children who are low functioning be, belong to regular school. But nobody really do anything with them if they go to regular school in Ghana. They will let them run around. And the children who are verbal, sometimes the teachers they send them, go fetch this, go bring this, go do this. They teach them nothing. So the situation is similar in most African countries, because mm. I know Ghana, we don't have government support per se. Mm. The government has schools, the government schools. But they have special education teachers that they have. Unfortunately, they don't really have expertise in autism. Mm. They not learn how to work with children with autism. And I tell that that's something that people will have will have difficulty with me, but I'm sorry. My son has autism, and I will tell you if you know mm -hmm. you're not doing the right thing, you need to be told. Thankfully, what we've been doing is we've been working with certain schools and the GS, we've been training some teachers and doing inclusive education. You know, we call it an inclusive education model where we train them. That's, this is how you work, you work with these children. And then in the, the center also, we have one classroom where the, teacher, the children are doing quite well and we still can go to regular school. We train them how to raise their hand in class. And when the teacher is speaking, you cannot also talk. And you know, different things. And we really teach them everything, all the steps, how you play wow. with other children, and how you really, you know, how for them to socially interact. We're not sending them for academics per se. We're sending them there for friendships, you know, so you know how to interact with other mm. children. Mm. I'm fully doing this for the past five years, and the schools around us, they do not even charge us a penny for this, which is amazing. And it's been working so well so that some of the children and then end up going to regular school, and the parents understand that I go to the school with a facilitator who has been trained in basic autism. Wow. If they go to regular school without a facilitator, by the time they get to 10 years and above, we find them sending them back to us or the different autism centers because they just been walking around school because they say, oh, I've been doing inclusion. What I've learned, and you look at them, they can't even write their name. I mean, mm. why? So the schools and they keep saying, oh, we know about autism. They want the money. They charge them, some of them charge them double the fee. This is what's going on on the ground. Like Remy said, people who have money, who can afford it, 
and then the different services and things. But why must you charge my son double the money when you really don't have the services to provide them? Because mm -hmm. they still have a special education teacher here who is doing really nothing with the child. And this is what we we're finding that those who did not really seek us out early and went to regular school are now coming back. Mm. These three children who came back at 10 and they're like, oh, we went to, we did inclusion. But can barely write your name. And they're still running around all the time. So now you have to really go and train them how to sit, how to, you know, you know, just be, if you, you allow them to be autistic, but they know their rules. Autistics know their rules, right? For them, they will do what they have. Because they know you care about them. And when they come like that, it's a one on one. You have your um, facilitator with you. And if you want to go for a walk, because we don't really sit in the classroom and say, oh, you must, you must write, or you must do math, or you must. We know because of the sensory issues. If a child is having difficulty, we can always do a work outside. It's not the basic like a classroom where you must sit here. Oh, but you will do your work. Yeah. If you are acting up and we go under a tree to sit, you will do your work and complete it. Because that's the thing yeah. it's about. And it's all yeah. like William said, yeah. they're very smart and they look at them and they say, Oh, okay, I can't get away with this. So I might as well just do it. And that's mm -hmm. the and it's, wow. it's amazing how some of these kids are. But you see, some of the parents also, and they are gone, all those who are gone. I would say I don't blame them because the stigma, they have always been looking for a cure. So after they've been at the center or at another school for a year or two, and the child still has autism, they withdraw the child without telling you anything. And then they try another school, and another school, not really good for them for the child and this is what's going on but now we have as the different schools we've gotten together to say let us know where you have come from where have you been so we can check with the other schools so there's continuity of care all right wow Thank you, Madam Sewa. William, we've got a question on the screen for you. It says that, question to William, how can I get a formal diagnosis for my high-functioning autistic child? I think he is. He's already receiving special learning support at school. Okay. If you suspect that your child has got, um, or is on the spectrum, or is autistic, the first part of call should be your GP the general practitioner. Mm -hmm. Get to the hospital, speak to your GP, and make sure you document all the reasons for which you believe that your child is autistic. Um, if possible, make sure you list the triad of impairments, social communication, social um, imagination, and social interaction. And under these, list all the examples why you think um, your child has an impairment in these categories. Um, from there, he's gonna make a referral. The GP is gonna make a referral and you can take it from there. And it would be helpful if your school could also um, write something, a statement or a document or something to attach to um, your file to be given to the GP. And from there, things will pick up. And also okay, make so sure, you, yeah, it's also important to do that those steps before your child turns 18 or turns into adulthood because it's harder for an adult to get a diagnosis than for a child to get a diagnosis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. So, I mean, why should it be so? Why is it so? Um, I don't know. That's that's the way it is because <laughs> in the UK over here, so many things are centered around the child. The child is mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Is, uh, yeah. There's a lot of it's a team around the child working around the mm -hmm. child. There's so many mm -hmm. safeguarding issues. And it's actually a safeguarding issue if the child has got um something that needs to be followed up and it's not followed up. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. One of course, the consequences yeah. for unmet um, needs of an autistic person is that they might fall into depression and um, mm. anxiety. Mm. Mm. Yes. And, so. and I mean, and and of course, you know, as a parent, you know, if then your child is displaying, um, you know, these signs and then you don't take the child for assessment. And then, I mean, from the perspective of social care, I mean, that social be, services, yeah. we will be looking at neglect, isn't it? Yeah, so, exactly. yeah, and understand where you're coming from. Yeah. 
So, I mean, I want us to just move on to, um, you know, a, a kind of our final uh, area, and then we'll be bringing this to an end. I want us to look at, you know, um, stigma, you know, because, I mean, stigma around, um, um, stigma around disability, you know, it has a, a huge impact in terms of, you know, um, um, a, a huge impact in terms of the experiences, you know, of children and young people with 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 autism, and again the support offered them. In terms of stigma, can we just look at what are some of the you know, um, I mean, some of the you know, I I mean, causes of you know, what causes the stigma? What are some of the reasons for the stigma in in, in, in our society? I think a lot of the reasons for the stigma is misinformed people. Mm -hmm. um, there's not enough. There's not enough people out there putting information out that's the correct information. Um, with anything that you know we look into or what we believe in, you should definitely do research. There's just not enough awareness. Um, I know here with our um, with our students. I mean, I know back way way back we used to call them like disabled or handicapped or things like that. Now in schools here we call them our special populations, and so a lot of what we do. Is so that the kids are not secluded, we include them. So I may have students that have needs in my classroom that are going to be there because it's a general ed classroom. But I may also have students that I enlisted as their general ed teacher, but they will be in another classroom. For example, I had a student that um, he was in a wheelchair. So he was in a class where they could better serve his needs because I'm a general ed teacher. So I couldn't be able to, and he has an assistant. So we have one-on-one -on -one assistance as well that assist with students. So he would be in there because they had what they were more equipped to serve him. They had changing tables. He had a one-on-one. -on -one. So his one-on-one -on -one would then bring him to the general ed classroom when we were doing activities or when we were doing parties. So he's included with his peers. And as a teacher, I create an inclusive classroom so that kids know no matter what we look like or you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, we're all welcome here. So making sure that we are creating those environments where students know that everyone is welcome regardless of how they look. Um, also being able to, I know here, a big thing here in America, we have um, something I actually have on the shirt. I don't know if y'all can see it, but it's called the Buddy Walk. And oh, okay, I can see. Here, my, my daughter's friend has Down syndrome. So once a year, they organize a walk, and we go walk for the kids to raise money for Down syndrome awareness. We also have autism awareness here. Here we place a lot of things so that those students are not exiled. Those students are now included as, you know, as students and as adults because they all come to these walks. And now we are more open and we are supportive of what they are doing. And I know because here we're more progressive in America. So that, I think, is the biggest difference. And when I hear William talking about some of the practices and things that they've done over there, my face is like, because it makes me physically cringe to think that that is how you would treat a human. Um, so I think, you know, because here we're a little bit more progressive, it's about awareness and being an advocate. If you see something being done wrong, speak up. Don't become a part of the problem, but becoming part of the solution, I think is the biggest thing. And being, and being aware, being educated. Mm. There's so mm. many things out there on the internet that are not true, but going and finding out the correct source and asking people, asking a question goes so further than what you could ever imagine on someone that is very skilled in knowledge in that area. So, you know, making sure that we're speaking up. And as, as parents, I'm not a parent, but I, I, I have, you know, nieces and nephews and I speak to parents on the regular. Being an advocate for your child is the one single biggest gift that you can give to them. Never sit wow. and let someone tell you yeah. what your child can and cannot do because every child can do it. If you put in that child's mindset that they can, then they will. And that's always my biggest push as a teacher. I don't care if the kid doesn't have whatever. They can do what they put their mind to. And as a parent, stepping up and standing up for your child and getting that teacher to back you up. If a parent comes to me and asks, hey, have you seen this? Absolutely. Writing everything down, backing up and being on the same playing field. Because as a teacher, we're not there to try to shoot your child down. We are there to build your child up. And to make sure that your child is successful, not only in the classroom, but as a citizen, 
as a person in the world that's going to grow up and be somebody. So that's the biggest thing that I can say is making sure that you're advocating and, and doing everything that you can do with so many things going on in the world right now. Make sure that you're on that front line for your kid advocating so that they get everything that they deserve so that they have a fighting chance out here. Wow, 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 wow. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, Juliet is saying that, what well, I mean, one of the uh, main, well, factors contributing to um, 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 stigma is, is lack of education, lack of awareness. And Juliet is saying that as parents, as carers, as caregivers, it's important that, you know, we advocate. Advocate, you can't, I mean, you, you can't not do that, you know. You have to constantly advocate for your child, advocate for your child, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep creating awareness, keep supporting your child. You know, you cannot stop, you know, you cannot say you can't do that. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at we're looking at stigma and the impacts, you know, in terms of the impact and how you know stigma and how that impacts on on, on the child's experiences, you know, in terms of um in terms of, I'm just looking at, in terms of, you know, um, you know, other parts of the world, Ghana, Nigeria, and all that, you know, I, I have had some misconceptions, you know, that, you know, disab I mean, these disabilities, I mean, autism, for instance, learning disability and all that, I, I have had some, um, you know, misconceptions that, you know, they are caused by demons and spirits and evil spirits, and it's a punishment from the gods, you know, it's, it's caused by witchcraft. And obviously, when we talk about our abuse, these misconceptions greatly impact on the um, on some of the reasons why you know uh, um, you know these children are abused by this by by society by people because of these misconceptions. I mean, in terms of your experiences, Dr. Remy, you know, what are your experiences, or what have you heard, or what have you read around you know these misconceptions, you know, and uh, which 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 causes um, the stigma. You know things around you know witchcraft and demons and spirits and you know i um, mean being the reason behind the disabilities yes i quite agree with you because from my own um research in nigeria i've met parents whose marriages broke up because the father will say in my family we don't have children like this we've had parents who have not been able to you know, people, pa parents who are traders, who people will not buy things from them because their children have disability. Wow. There, there's so many things. You know, when I, I remember there was that um, documentary about witches in one part of Nigeria, children. And when I think about it, I said, these children may have autism. And the way they treated them, even mm -hmm. killed them. Oh, I mean, it's God. very sad when you think about it. Yeah, it's, it's a cultural thing. I think the problem we have in most parts of Africa is we don't look at the scientific. We tend to look at the spiritual more than the scientific. So anything we cannot um, explain, we just think, oh, it, it is spiritual. That's why they come to demons or witches and everything. And it is very, very sad. I mean, it's just there's so much attached to it that I can't um, go into it. But one thing I know is that Maybe with more awareness, with more knowledge, and as well as with inclusive education, where children who have disabilities are in the same school as children without, so that they grew up together. Unlike when I was young, when we don't see children with disabilities. But now that there's inclusive education, and even if it's just an inclusive unit within the school, the, the ones who are able can see the ones who are disabled and know that they're all the same. I think it will help. It's yeah. just right from when they're little. Education, 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 from when the children are little to let them know that you are all the same. You are all the same. Education, education, education. What the child needs, you know, is support, you know, is support. And, in, you know, but then as a result of the misconceptions, as a result of, you know, the lack of awareness, lack of education and all that, we end up, you know, assigning um, spiritual uh, spirits or evil spirits and, you know, um, witches and all that, curses and all that has been the reasons for, you know, the child's um, condition. That is really, really, you know, that, that is really sad, and that is obviously, you know, abusive. Uh, yeah, Madam Sewa, do you have any anything to add to this, like this conversation in terms of uh, perspective, um, 
from Ghana. Basically, what uh, we said and everything else has been said, but our belief systems, anything that is not in the norm, quote unquote, it has to be there's a reason behind it. And I would say that um, religious bodies, the churches, the mosques, and what have you, haven't done well. Because when you go to them, they don't really encourage, they're not encouraging. So what we have been doing, we've been doing a lot of church awareness, because, and we've gone to some mosques, with uh, the Muslims amongst us, to go and talk to them about autism. Why autism is not a curse, why it is not witchcraft, why it's not something that somebody did. You can't blame it on anyone. So we need more of the awareness, which we've been, uh, we, we need more of it. But it's important also for parents to come to a level of acceptance. Because if they don't come to that level of acceptance, then people, they are fodder for everybody telling them anything. You know, that you did this or you did that. Because they have to accept it. So they become the frontline person, as Tina, uh, not Tina, Juliet has said, that, you know, you're the advocate. You're willing to fight for your child. For me, I am out there in front, willing to fight for not my son and other children. Anybody, I don't know how I became this advocate, but really, when you think of it, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong. Put yourself in that position that somebody coming to call you a witch or your child is cursed or this child is that. When we go and then this is where bullying comes in. Children who are higher functioning are bullied through school. They are called names. People are mean to them. And you will find that, in fact, in the end, a lot of people who end up incarcerated are persons on the autism spectrum or persons with other disabilities that people don't really understand them. And it's a shame. We need to try and find a way to stop all these things. A lot of children go into drugs and whatnot because nobody understands them and they, they just end up in the, on the wrong side of the law. Not through any fault of theirs, but because this is what happened. And then they're incarcerated for no good reason, and they are there, and the situation gets worse. And nobody seems to understand, nor even care. So the situation in Ghana, as has been said about the witchcraft, and, and unfortunately, the educated people, that's what really irks me. When they are educated, and they still believe in such, I don't have the right word to say, because I'm really, it really gets me angry that people who are educated, who should know better, that they go and they, we have these belief systems and we say we're going to church, yet we will still go to the malam in the corner or we'll go and see this other person and just go and believe all kinds of things. And what we have here, I don't know if you have it in Nigeria, we have prayer camps where children are taken to where they are beating the demons out of them because they have a disability. Honestly, that's sad. Very sad. That is that is very sad. That is very sad. And again, like we are saying, that contributes to you know the abuse you know faced by you know I mean that contributes to lack of education um, and I know awareness, lack of awareness, and, and and the fact that I mean like Dr. Remy is saying because we don't know because we have no solutions because you know we just don't want to know. We then it's very it's very easy to assign this to you know some spirits or some you know witches and you know and because that is a very easy way of you know trying to explain what is happening to the child what this child needs is support what this child needs is you know emotional and practical support what this child needs is love a lot of love 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 and understanding and again what this child needs is to be treated as a unique individual you know and not a child with problems and not a child who is cursed and not a child who is a difficult child and not a child who has to be locked up in a room because you know he or she is causing so much trouble and not not a child who has to be you know taken away somewhere away from the family and you know somewhere you know because the child because parents and caregivers can't you know 
don't can't meet the, the child's needs and don't understand the child's condition because of lack of education, because of lack of awareness. We we are we bring in this one end now. So like we usually do, um, we will go round. You know, each person your final word to our viewers. Um, next time, you know, we would be talking about because we're looking at a, we're looking at um, stigma. You know, we will be looking at um, abuse because there's a lot of abuse going on. Abuse of you know children and young people who have you know who are diagnosed with autism. And, you know, there's so much abuse going on. And like I said, what they need is lots of love and lots of care and lots of, you know, support. And but then, for, unfortunately, for, for, for some children, they are not getting this. So we would be talking about um, abuse. But then, yeah, going around, we you know we want uh, uh, individual panel members, your final comments um, to our viewers before we finish today's show. Um, William, is it okay to start with you? What's your final comment for today's show? Um, my final comment for today's show is to plead with viewers to break the stigma of autism. There's so much stigma in the system because of the fear of the unknown, as our auntie Sewa said. Um, we are scared because we don't see people um, like us in the media, especially in Africa. We don't see um, autistic people acting or being in the office or being at the forefront. So um, it's like we're almost like aliens. It's time for us to actually come out. Employers, please employ autistic people. We can do the job. We can be trained. We can um, contribute. We can make a, a positive contribution to society. Yeah. So please sure. include us. That's it. Good point. Can we come to Madam Sewa, please? Yes, I can. Your thank, final you. Uh, thank you for this program and, uh, and thank you to the viewers. And um, I think I wish we had more time to talk about the stigma and what's been going on and how autistic have been suffering. And my comments, I know we've been talking about the child, the child, the child. The, the child with autism grows to be an adult with autism. Mm -hmm. so there is this, in, in, in Ghana, I can see that we don't have much in Ghana. Thankfully, a lot of the children who work that are with me are, become, are becoming adults. I have a couple of adults including my son, who now are able to go to, my son goes to work, that's data entry at one place, and that's finishing work at a printing press. So yes, he needs a job, somebody who will really pay him. We have done this to prove to people that, yes, he can. And we need people to see the work that they do, and they're amazing workers, this is what I want to say. They are amazing, they're the best workers you can find around. And thank you to the viewers and uh, the children in Ghana and across Africa I need a lot of support because we don't have the services really. We don't have everything without uh, volunteers that we get internationally and locally. We wouldn't even be able to make it. So I want to take this opportunity if they're listening to say thank you to everyone and continue to support the work we do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's really good, helpful. Um, can we come to you, Juliet, please? Um, I, I just want to say thank you for having me on here. My experience is just a little bit different because I do gen ed education, but I also, you know, come in and, and support. Um, the biggest thing that I can say um, to, to for people to take away from this is, at the end of the day, be kind. Um, mm -hmm. it, it takes nothing to be nice to someone. It takes nothing to show somebody that you care. Even a simple wave or a smile at someone can change their whole entire day. Um, I think we've got to become more aware um, of, of what's going on. We have to be the pioneers on the education side to, you know, to assist people in their quest mm -hmm. to help others. Um, education is so important. And I will agree, even some of the most educated people say some of the stupidest things. So to be mindful and conscientious of what you're saying and what you're putting out there in the environment um, for me is the biggest thing. And also be an advocate, go out there, do the work and support the movement. You know, one it takes one person to change something. So you could be that one person, like I said here, like um, we do, we do a lot of walks 
we raise money, we do things to bring awareness. So you can be that one person that brings awareness to your community. And think about you're taking that to 10, 15 people in your community. They're taking that to another 10 and 15 people. Now you have a movement. And that's what it's about, mm -hmm. creating awareness, making moves, and making a difference. Wow. Creating awareness, making a move, and you know, making a difference. Wow. Thank you so much, Juliet. And then finally, we'll come to Dr. Remy. What is your final word to our viewers, please? My final word will be for as many people as possible to get the government to practice inclusion. I know they said they are practicing inclusive education, but I think what they've done is cut a copy and paste. This is what the international government is saying we should be doing. And so we're saying we are doing it without actually doing it. So the people who write the policy, they don't, they don't care about how it's implemented. Whether it's implemented or not, they don't care. But they've written the policy so that they can say when they go to wherever that, oh, yes, we practice inclusive education. This is our policy. So my, what I want to say is that as many people as possible who can have access to the government all over Africa should please plead with them to do something practice inclusion really practice inclusion not just have it on paper thank you and hold wow. people accountable hold them accountable mm. if they say they're going to do something make sure they do it hold people accountable yep. sure accountability mm -hmm. hold people mm -hmm. responsible they should be accountable yes totally and i agree I with you and in practice inclusion please you need to train the teachers don't just say things and say we are practicing and teachers have not been trained who have no yes. clue at what they do with the children. So please, we need trained teachers to know what they're doing. And the teachers who have gone to special, done special education and are not giving their best to the children, I'm sorry, we don't need to be teaching our children. Get another job. <laughs> wow, this is the... I know you can see how passionate people are about this subject, you know, about promoting the well-being of children with autism, um, children with special needs. Thank you so much for coming on the program. And to our viewers, thank you so much for your contribution, for your questions, for your support. You know, let us, we are, we are all in this together. Let us educate, create awareness, you know, advocate. And together, you know, we are working together. We want to move forward together. We want to support children. We want to support people living with um, autism, people living with, uh, uh, you know, special needs. You know, we are in this together. So thank you so much. And thank you, our viewers, for your knowledge, for your expertise, for, the, you know, the skills you brought over here. And once again, thank you. And then we are again meeting over here and again next week, Thursday. Uh, we will be looking at um, abuse. And again, we'll be looking at, support um, systems or um, available support so that people would know where they would need to go to when they need support. So thank you so much once again and bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye